So let's open our Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 3. A uh, popular little spot that we've been in for a couple of weeks now. And uh, we uh, will read uh, verse 14 through to verse 17. <coughs> Revelation 3, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, which reads, For this cause I bow my knee, my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being able to, Lord, have the, uh, the ability and the freedom to, to meet here today. When there are so many uh, of your children in this world that cannot do so uh, in different parts of the world. And Father, uh, I just do pray that uh, as we open your word, Lord, that we would truly be Lord, open to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit of God towards our hearts. Uh, and Father, I, I Lord, uh, just do uh, praise you and thank you that we can do this today. And uh, Lord, uh, I truly do ask and pray your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, looking at verse number 16, where it reads that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Um, we, we kind of looked at that fairly extensively last week, but, you know, it really, that, that step, I, I realise it's only one of steps there in those verses that we've looked at but to be strengthened in the inner man by the power of God is so important for us in our lives as Christians we thought about last week last Sunday afternoon about how uh, we so easily as as uh, God's children when we're truly born again we so easily will look at something, the Lord will show us something in our lives that, that needs to be not there or, to, or something that does need to be there or something He wants us to do. And we think that because the Lord has laid that on us and we have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, uh, that it's then okay for us of our own selves to, to go on and, and, uh, and do it of our own strength and that God will just bless that. No, that's, that's not the way it works. And uh, you know, when God is showing you He wants something in, you, in your life, then He's saying, I will also empower you to have victory over this or to do that which you've never done before, whatever the case may be. And, uh, uh, and that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. That's why he's, he's there. He's there to convict us of sin, but He's also to teach us all things. And, and, uh, and when, you, when you study the Word of God, and you see the early church uh, in particular, and you see the power of God working through them, uh, to empower them in doing what uh, that the ministry that God called them to, uh, you know, it bears it bears that out. You've got to really not let the flesh cut in uh, on God. He doesn't just show us what He wants. He doesn't just go, "Yes, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you." But He wants to also walk with you and and do those things through you. <clears throat> And so uh, uh, last week we looked at, uh, in both services, uh, we looked at Joshua. And uh, at, at, one page, at one point you know, I was saying about him being a picture of a second generation Christian. That is where a child grows up in a family where the parents uh, are born again, where they're saved. And the children come to know the Lord Jesus Christ uh, within that Christian household. And, uh, and they grow up under that umbrella. And uh, what we look at today applies 
not only to people in that in that uh, in that category, but really this does apply to to every born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we all have times in our lives where our faith will be tested, uh, as and uh, and, that, and and that whether we will uh, draw on life's lessons that the Lord has used uh, to give us strength in the inner man by the Holy Spirit of God and continue our walk of faith the way that we ought to. Now, or the other option, of course, is for whatever reason, decide to either just give in uh, and walk uh, in the pleasure of sin for a season or even have a foot in both camps, trying to half live for the Lord uh, but at the same time partake of the world. So the question is for you and for you and I today: What will we do? What will we do? What will be our our, our choice when uh, when those times come? When uh, when we are faced with a challenge, when we're faced with something new in life, when we're faced with a difficulty, or we're faced with uh, you know uh, the temptation of the world, even what will we do? What will our faith? dictate to us what will we do I also mentioned last week we had done a Bible study a couple of Wednesday nights ago about Joshua and how his life was like that of a second generation Christian uh, and, uh, and didn't have the extreme ups and downs of life like Moses had um, Joshua had an advantage by being Moses minister or servant in other words he had the benefit of, of observing and learning from Moses life in a uh, sheltered environment, and when you think about it, that's what a that's what a second generation Christian really is, isn't it? It's someone that's that's uh, that's grown up, like I said, in a Christian household. <clears throat> they're under the uh, the uh, protection or environment. Uh, uh, they're in that in that house, the Christian household, and uh, and so uh, there comes a time, but there comes a time where where as they grow up, or as we grow up. As any second generation Christian grows up, where they've got to make their own decisions in life. And what will that decision be? And so uh, with Joshua, it led to being strengthened in the inner man. He had a strong faith and a strong love for the Lord. Then, uh, as we looked at on Sunday night, in respect of being strengthened in the inner man for strong faith, we then thought about Paul in respect of his faith, how he got to the end of his life, and he said he had kept the faith. Uh, finished his course. Oh, sorry, he finished his. He yeah, kept the faith, but he finished his course and, and fought a good fight as well. Uh, and so his faith was uh, is the is such a great example to us when we study the Word of God and we look at we look at Paul's life. And uh, uh, he was very unique, and that I, I think I can honestly say there's nobody else like Paul that we can read of here in, in the uh, in the Word of God that went through so much for the Lord and still came out. Uh, the way he did. And so we looked at the, the strengthening, strengthening of the inner man by the Holy Spirit that it leads to a, a good testimony uh, and then strength to resist temptation. And uh, so we can see all of this literally in the life of Joshua. Uh, and for a little while this morning, I want to think about how Joshua became that man that we see uh, that was strengthened in the inner man by the Spirit uh, that uh, was, a, was a strong man of faith. He resisted temptation. He he uh, he had a great testimony. And uh, point number one this morning is Joshua got to understand uh, firsthand the long-lasting scars of Moses' old life. Now, when I say firsthand, I don't mean that he actually saw what Moses did uh, or how Moses was in Egypt before he fled to the wilderness. But uh, by being right there with with Moses. Uh, being his servant, uh, it, he undoubtedly understood uh, the past life of Moses before he fled to the wilderness after, when he was 40 years old, having been raised in the household of Pharaoh and being wise uh, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty and word and deeds, uh, as it says in he, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And uh, he would have heard uh, from, from Moses being right there, being his servant, how he came to that point where he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God and, and forsake the, the pleasure of sin for a season, uh, as it says in Hebrews 11, verse 25. And, and let me just say this. Let me just say this. Um, sin is pleasurable. 
in the physical sense, sin is pleasurable. But it comes with a huge, huge, huge cost. And Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness as a result of that sin. He gave up on God. He's still kind of, yeah, yeah, God's there. He was in the presence of God still at the Mount, at Mount Sinai. Uh, he was still around the presence of God there. And he, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, uh, negative about being there. He was quite comfortable there in the presence of God. But at the same time, uh, he, he, uh, he wanted to uh, forget about the past life. It came with a great cost. And so... Uh, God blessed Joshua with a safe environment to learn of the folly of sin without having taken part in it. That's what I mean by first hand. He, he heard the life of Moses when he was raised in the, in the palace of Pharaoh. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we thought about this also, but let me just use this as, as an illustration. You know, Moses was raised in the, in the palace of Pharaoh. He was... Uh, wise in all the wisdom of Egypt. He was mighty in words and deeds. In other words, of, the, of worldly life. Uh, he's very wise in all that stuff and he was mighty in those things. But you can equate that to Hebrews 11 where it says that he forsook the pleasure of sin for a season. In other words, uh, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God as the scriptures tell us. And, and what the life that he lived uh, was, was one that was not uh, what God would want in anyone's life. Now, um, when, uh, when, when it came to that point when Moses was 40 years old, uh, he looked out on the children of Israel. He knew that that, that was his brethren. He looked on them and, uh, and, he, said, and he said to, uh, to himself, well, now, now it's time. I've got to, I've got to do something. He, he already knew, as we studied, uh, I'm not going to study it again now, but he already knew that it was God's will for him to be the instrument for the children of Israel to be delivered from Egypt. And so this is where, uh, like I said earlier, when we in our life, uh, we know that we've got God on our side and we can see something that God wants, we must not act in the flesh because it will go pear-shaped. Uh, God doesn't say, here's what I want you to do, so go to it and just you do it in your own strength. No, no, no. Because that's what Moses did. That's exactly what he did. And uh, he, he, it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 25, that, that uh, he, he assumed that the children of Israel would, would understand that, that God, by his hand, would deliver them from the Egyptians. But they didn't. And so Moses, acting against one Egyptian um, soldier or whatever he was, uh, you know, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, useless, wasn't it? And uh, what was the end result? He fled into the wilderness. He gave up on God. And you think about that. When the Lord appeared in the burning bush in Exodus 3 to Moses uh, and, and said, I'm going to send you down to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel, Moses goes, no, 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 no. We finished with that 40 years ago. Uh, who am I that I should go there? And I, you know, I'm, I'm slow of speech and I stutter and, and I'm like this and like that. So no, no God, I've given up on that. You know, that was back there. Uh, I tried to do what you what you'd given me to do and, and it failed. Oh, I gave up. And so Joshua, he could uh, he could look if you look at Moses' testimony, he could get a hold of that, and and he learned from that. Let me just say this: if God has blessed you with a safe environment to learn of the folly of sin without having to take part in it, without taking part in it, let me say this: if that is you treasure that environment. You might say, why? What, what makes you an expert? Because I've lived both sides of the fence. I am a first generation Christian and I've lived both sides of the fence. And the other side of the fence ain't green like you think it is. It is not green like you think it is. And it does cost. So if that's you currently, treasure it. Please treasure it. We first learned of Joshua when Israel had already been delivered from, from Egypt in the Word of God. And he's, and he's uh, noted as being Joshua's servant a little bit later on. 
but that is Moses whom the Lord would use to do great and mighty things to force Pharaoh's hand to let Israel go was, was, the, one that, was the one that Joshua was serving. So he was under that secure umbrella of not only God's deliverance from Egypt, but under Moses' protection through this God-chosen leader. Now, here is Joshua in this situation, placed right there with Moses, whose testimony uh, was that of a transformed man. He's, he's been there for 40 years in the, in the wilderness, and, and uh, God you know, appeared to him there in the burning bush and, and uh, brought Moses along. He's, he's already humble and meek by this time because of all the, what he's experienced. And uh, by the time they've, they've come out of Egypt, Moses is a transformed man well and truly. Joshua has that benefit. He can sit there as Moses' servant and observe. Now, Joshua learned the after effect and the scars of sin without having to partake of them. Joshua looked and learned. And if, if we think that can't ever happen to us individually, uh, we're kidding ourselves. You can. Any one of us. The devil knows your weaknesses. He knows my weaknesses. He knows how to push the buttons to try and tempt you, to try and tempt me, to try and, to try and discourage us, to try and get us to, to, to uh, you know, gaze at our navels and, and give up. He knows. He knows. And so he, so Joshua had that benefit. He was under, under Moses' umbrella. And let me just say this, Christian, if you are at a crossroads in your life and are thinking that the world will take away your burdens, your trials, your problems, or whatever out of your mind by partaking of it, um, let me just say this, it's your old sinful nature presenting uh, what is really fool's gold. And it pays a cruel price. Don't go down that path because you've watched someone else do it. That person you follow won't help you when you reap the painful harvest of sin in due time. They won't. You know, and say, how do you know? Because I've seen it time and time and time again. Look and learn from someone who has already reaped what they have sown. And if you ask them what they have reaped, that, you know, when, that when they have reaped the harvest of their sinful nature, if it was worth it, and if they're honest, they'll urge you not to do it. I promise you they will. If they've already come to harvest time, they'll say, no, they don't get in that part. Joshua looked and learned. Point number two, God put Joshua aside in a safe place to witness the folly of sin firsthand without partaking. Now, when I say firsthand again, it's in a different sense. Uh, he didn't see Moses, what Moses did in Egypt, but he heard Moses' testimony firsthand uh, in this particular one, we're going to look at in Exodus chapter 24. I'll get you to go there, Exodus 24 and, uh, and Exodus 32. Exodus 24 and Exodus 32. We're not going to uh, tarry long here in these verses because uh, I've got a few here to, to look at. But uh, in Exodus 24, in verses 9 to 15, we see the time where uh, the children of Israel are at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses has already been going up and down the mountain a little bit there to, to talk to the Lord. The Lord's already given him the Ten Commandments and a bit of other stuff there. In Exodus 24, uh, let's have a look there in verse number 1 to start with. It says, uh, The Lord said, to Mo said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And so uh, the Lord's calling those particular people to him. Uh, at the uh, not right up the mountain, but uh, as it says, their worship be afar off. Now go over to verse nine. It says, "Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And when they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Uh, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. So." So what they saw there basically was, that was an outline of God. They didn't see him in his full, full glory. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to, uh, to do that. No one can actually look on God in a sinful state and live 
And so here they, they saw him as it were of a paved work of a sapphire stone in, in you know, the body of heaven in his clearness. So they're seeing an outline like that. But there near the, near the mount, up close to the mount, perhaps at the, at the feet of the mountain. And then uh, further down in verse number 12 it says, and the, Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Now look at verse 13. It says, And Moses rose up and his minister, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. But then verse 14, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. So in other words, Here's, the, uh, here's uh, Aaron, uh, his two sons, the 70 elders of Israel. Uh, they're there at the foot of the mount. The, the, the camp is down here still. It's, it's set back. They're, they're not with, in the camp at this time. Moses and Joshua, his minister, are going up the mountain. Uh, Joshua's staying you know, part of the way up the mountain, halfway up the mountain or whatever. And, uh, and so Aaron, his sons, the 70 elders of Israel are instructed to stay where they were at the foot of the mount. They were special people. They got to see the outline of God. Now, stop and think about that in, in a, to, to compare to, for us. Moses and Joshua, obviously, Moses, mainly, mainly, Moses was the one that was going to draw really close to God. Joshua's halfway down the mount. He's, he's kind of up there, closer to the Lord than, than these other guys. But then here's also uh, Aaron, his sons, and the 70 elders there. They're at the foot of the mount. They're closer than the main people of, of, of the, uh, the children of Israel. Closer than the camp. So what are we seeing there? We're seeing a picture of, uh, and, I, and I, I emphasize this, it's only a picture, but it's a good picture. We're seeing a picture of those that are closest to the Lord. Uh, some of it's you know, you know, pretty close to the Lord, but not quite there. Uh, then these other guys down here at the foot of the mount, they're, you know, they're, they're also growing in grace and in the knowledge of the, of the Lord. They'd seen the Lord there, the outline of him at least. And then the camp back here is your average Christian that, that maybe they, they have a bit of a struggle, but they're doing okay. And so uh, Moses goes up the mount. Joshua's faithfully sitting there on the side of the mount waiting for him. But let's go over to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. Now remember, the uh, Aaron and his two sons and the elders were supposed to stay there at the foot of the mount and wait for Moses to come down. And so Exodus 32, without going into the whole the whole chapter here, because we you know, time's marching on. The people here in Exodus 32, verse one, it says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Now take note, they didn't say, As for this man Moses that God used to bring us up out of Egypt. They didn't say that. They said Moses that brought us up out of Egypt. God's out of the equation here. And where is Aaron? And for that matter, we, we can assume that the, the rest of the uh, 70 elders that are there with him and his two sons, uh, they're back in the camp. They've gone away from the presence of God. They've gone away from the presence of God. Joshua's still safe up here up the side of the mountain. God's tucked him away in a little, little place up here on the side of the mountain to wait for Moses. It might have been a hard place for him to be for, a, for a 40 days or so. Sleeping amongst the rocks and the dirt and everything else. And uh, look, the Lord might put you in a bit of a hard place at times in your life, in your walk with Him. But if He's sheltering you from other things, praise the Lord for that. Because Aaron, the priest, said of the elders, they got drawn back into the the main camp. They went backwards in their walk with God. But Joshua's sheltered up here on the mountain. So Joshua 
He's there. Finally, the Lord says to, uh, to Moses there in chapter 32, you better go down. The people have already corrupted themselves. And, uh, and so Moses goes down with the two tables of stone and uh, picks up Joshua on the way down. Come on, let's go. Now look over in verse 17 and 18. It says, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And then verse 18, Moses, and he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. No, it's not, in other words, it's not the, not the noise of war, but the noise of them that sing, do I hear. Now, there's a few things we can get from that. There's a few things we can get from that. Comparing Aaron uh, to... Uh, to Moses. Joshua, the picture of a second generation Christian, heard the sound of war. That's what he said. That's what it says. That's what he what he could hear. But Moses, the picture of a first generation Christian, knew better and heard the sound of sin in the camp. He said, It's the noise of him that sing do I hear. And so as soon if you look in verse 19, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf, the dancing, Moses' anger waxed hot. You can just picture Moses on the way down. Joshua goes, I can, I can hear the noise of war in the camp. And, and Moses is going, no, 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 that's not what I can hear. I can hear singing. What are we seeing there? We're seeing a second generation Christian that's been sheltered from the sin of this world, the pleasures of this world, and he's going, what's that noise? It sounds like war. And Moses is going, no, no, I know what that is. I've been there, I know what that is. They get down to the camp, and as we see, you know, Moses, got, Moses' anger waxed hot when he saw what was happening. He throws down the tablets of stone uh, and, and deals with the matter. But you know what, from verse 17 onwards, in this particular incident, with the golden calf and, and the aftermath of it, um, Joshua's not mentioned again. The last thing that Joshua's mentioned was where he heard the noise of war. So God has put Joshua there, up in that safe place, closer to his presence than Aaron, his two sons, 70 elders of Israel. He's put him up there in that safe place so that he could abstain from all appearance of evil. He's not exposed to it. He comes down in his innocency. He goes, hey Moses, it sounds like there's a noise of war in the camp. Moses, no, 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 that's not what it is. Not at all. Let me just say this second generation Christian, or if you happen to be in a blessed situation where you're a first generation Christian, but you've never been exposed to, uh, you haven't been exposed to uh, worldly life in, in much of a way, and you're, and you're ignorant of it, stay that way. Stay that way. You might say, but, but, you know, I, you know, no, you don't, you don't want to play with it. It's like playing with a snake. Once, once, once you play with a snake and it bites you, it's, you're bit, you're bitten. You can't undo the snake bite once you're bitten. Christian, don't play with sin. And so Joshua. The Lord kind of goes, okay, Joshua, well, that's that's enough. We don't we don't need to we don't need to write any more about you in this incident. That's all that people need to know. Uh, I put you aside so that you can witness firsthand, in the sense of actually see it with your eyes firsthand, the results of sin. And he did. So Joshua learned. He looked and he learned. He was strengthened in the inner man by by the Spirit witnessing to his heart about the harvest of sin. Sin reaps a harvest. And it may, it may be a long while until the crop comes, but the harvest does come. It does come. The third thing that we're going to learn from this time in respect of Joshua uh, is, as the Lord said to Samuel, the prophet, when he, when he was sent to anoint David, king of Israel, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, 
For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God looked on David and saw someone who would serve him faithfully all his life. And the Lord did special work in David's life from a young age to set him on the right path. And thus it was with Joshua. The Lord looked down on Joshua and he saw a man that had a heart to, to do right all of his life. And, and he worked in Joshua's life. But people, if you, if you want the Lord to strengthen you in your inner self by the power of the Holy Spirit, then you need to give him your heart in respect of your life as a born-again believer. Joshua looked and learned. Joshua looked and learned. Sorry, then point number three is Numbers 13, Numbers, Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. Let's go to Numbers 13 and have a look there. Numbers 13. Now, this is the well-known time where... Uh, the 12 men out of each tribe of Israel were sent in to spy out the land early in their journeys in the wilderness. And so uh, Joshua was partnered with Caleb and, uh, and off they went and, and the, uh, the other 10 went off two by two into the land of Israel, uh, what was to be the land of Israel, the promised land. And they spied out the land, they came back and we know how it goes. Uh, the other 10 all came back and went, oh, well, I was asked, you know, it's a beautiful land, but... You know, we're like grasshoppers in the sight of the giants that are in the land. And we're all going to get wiped out, oh, oh doom and gloom, we're going to get wiped out, wiped out. You know, so, um, but Joshua and Caleb, and mainly Caleb, I have to say, he was the, he was the, uh, the, the loudest with his, uh, with his words. They're going, no, 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 no. God has given us this good land. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't panic, it's all, it's all good. God has, God has brought us to here. God has shown us this is the land that he wants us to have. He's just sent us in to spy out the land. So in other words, don't look at it as defeat. Look at it as an opportunity because God is in control. And Joshua and Caleb, yeah, they, 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 were, uh, they were faithful to God in that particular time. So you might say, well, how, how does this work? What, what's this got to do with what we're looking at? The first instance we, we thought about was Moses' testimony. Joshua got it first hand from Moses what his life was like before the Lord you know, really got a hold of him. And he learned about the, the results of sin. The second one was where he got to see it see first hand, not just hear, but see first hand when, when these things happened. And God had protected him, put him to the side so he could witness it from that from that position. Now thirdly, uh, here he is, he's one of the twelve going in to spy out the land. The Lord's going, okay, Joshua, you've had those other two, those other two building blocks and you walk with me. So now it's your turn to see what you're going to do. Will you be like the other ten? Or will you be strong in the inner man? You might see the giant problems in the land, but how will you look at them? The other ten panicked and they, 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 they you know, raised their voices and made the whole children of Israel to sin and to, uh, and, and to, and to cause you know, Israel to say, oh, you know, we can't do this, we can't do this, you know, it's, it's a big problem. And so what was the result of that sin? They, they reaped a harvest. Israel would go on to spend 40 years in total in the wilderness because of that. Joshua had heard and grasped the testimony of Moses. He had grasped the result of the pleasure of sin for a season. He had then witnessed firsthand the reaping from sin in the matter of the golden calf, which he saw for himself, which the Lord had sheltered him from. And here in Numbers 13, he was put in the tiny minority with Caleb uh, by God to strengthen him in the inner man by the power of God to make what he had seen and learned before in those other examples to make them real in his own life. So Joshua at this point proved by his own experience that he really believed in the Lord and really trusted him to a level that would last a lifetime. So just in closing, Christian, let, let me ask you this. How about you? How about me? We all have an old sinful nature. I have too. Whether you be a first or second generation child of God, have you stopped 
have you observed, have you learned in a way that you now have the, the glue of God to stick for the rest of your life in your walk with Him? Have you? Have you learned from what God has let you see and experience that you need to be strengthened in the inner man by the Holy Spirit of God? And not trust in your own flesh. Not trust in yourself. Joshua did. As we look at, as we look at uh, the world around us, the, the Christian world around us, we see so many families where the children these days, they come to a point where, where the, the, world, the world just draws them. As you've heard me say a number of times through the years, Every tub has got to stand on its own bottom. And that's true. We have. We've got to stand on our own bottom. We've got to, we've got to make our own decisions. And whether it be me uh, having been saved, clearly saved for um, close on 40 years, or whether it be someone that's been saved for one year, we all get to points in our lives where we're tempted, we're, t we're tested, we're, we, we've got trials, we've got tribulations or whatever it might be. And where does the mind go? I'll be honest. You know, I think, yeah, yeah, I think I could probably get a job back in the call centre doing this and doing that. That's the trials and the temptations, that's what it does, that's the flesh. What are you going to do? You're going, to, you're going to chase the world or you're going to stay faithful. You're going to learn from what God has let you experience in life. Are you? You're going to be a Joshua? I hope so. Please, brethren, let God strengthen you in the inner man by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for being able to think on these things this morning. And Lord, uh, you know all things, Father, and you know that we are all just frail human beings. We all have an old nature. The old nature will always think the worst or want to head towards the worst. But Lord, I pray that in, those, that in those times that come for all of us, that Lord, you would remind us through the Holy Spirit of God what you have done for us. That we are involved by the Holy Spirit of God. That you, that you will, Lord, speak to our hearts and remind us of all of those wonderful things that you have done, Lord, starting with salvation, being saved from our sins and from our difficult health. Lord, how easy we forget. How easy we forget. Lord, I just do pray, Father, that you would, you would uh, just lead and guide as we uh, come to a time where we reflect before you of where we are, we are at in our own lives. And Father, I just thank you for that. Lord, I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. So as, as the music plays, let's let's have heads bowed, eyes closed. All heads bowed, bowed, all eyes are closed. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. How about you? Do you walk and learn? Do you listen and learn? to be a Joshua. Praise God if you're sheltered from all the things of this world. Don't forsake that. Ask the Lord to help you to, to learn while you're in that environment. To keep you safe.
all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Let's, let's reflect on this time this morning. Let's pray. Let's uh, be upstanding. If you're not finished praying, please continue to do. Please do continue to pray. But if you are finished, let's uh, be upstanding. We'll sing number 102, first and last, of number 102.